on. Uh, now, my story, um, it started at design school. Um, I have, like, right now, um, about, about 15 years that I've been working with street kids, street-connected children and youth. Now, I just want to ask you guys, if I show you the word street kids, what are the first things you think of? Can you just uh, use the chat and throw me some uh, some words like the first stuff that pops in your, uh, up in your head when 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 you see the word street child or street kid? Baggy jeans, lack of educational opportunities, orphans, lack of resources, lack of access to education. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm doing quite a lot of keynote speeches uh, and businesses, and I always ask my audience this question, what do you think of what is the just I want to check what is the top of mind in people when we speak about street kids. And I can assure you, like every time when I ask people the question, what, what do you think of what is the top of mind talking about street kids, people think about these problems, people think about about drugs, people drink, think about uh, violence, people think People think about problems. The, the, the connection is always negativity, always problems. Just a second that I'm hustling with my with my presentation here. It's not working. Um, yeah, this is this is this is what comes up all the time. And this is pretty, pretty logical. Eh? I worked myself for about seven years in Latin America, I worked in Colombia, in Guatemala with street connected children. In, uh, in Guate, in the capital of Guatemala City in 2003, we identified 747 kids that were killed in social cleaning. That squad's entering the cities, you know, shooting the kids that were sleeping on the pavement and then cleaning up the bodies like, like garbage bags. Uh, so it's pretty normal that we think about problems when we speak about, uh, about those children. Still, I want to challenge the fact that we only think about problems. And, and this is fundamental, I think, in social work uh, and in social educational work. Uh, we always have that, that problem as the top of mind, as the core of our narrative and uh, in building our strategies of working with people in poverty. And I want to challenge it because, let's face it, if I would put you guys on a plane now, and we would fly to Guatemala City. And after clearing customs, I would ask you to hand in your smartphones, your credit cards, your, your money, uh, you know, your passports. And I would send you guys into the streets to start competing with my friends of 10, 11, 12 years old living on the pavements of the city of Guatemala City. And you would have to compete with them to survive the longest. Yeah, I'm, I'm very sorry, but I'm not going to bet my money on you guys. They're going to kick your asses. They're going to beat you. So... It's not only about problems, you know, if you if you speak about street kids, if you want to survive those streets for two days or two weeks or two months, you know, somehow you need to be resourceful, you need to be proactive, you need to have guts, you need to be uh, entrepreneurial as well. There is a positive side as well in that story of street connected children. And, and, and this is, I think, when we speak about education with, with vulnerable people and children and, 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 and kids and people in poverty, the first thing we have to do is understand the problems, but, but understand as well that it's a metal with two sides. And, and after understanding the problems, we have to, to shift that metal and, and shift to the opportunity view. So what we did when we started working with street kids is we stopped talking about the needy kids on the streets. And we started talking about the untapped talent in the streets that we're still not using as society. And that is a great opportunity for society. Building actually the problems into an opportunity focus is fundamental when you work in education, I think. If you want people to grow and flourish, they need to feel respected. They need to feel empowered. And often we go for the problem side and that is a consistent disempowering of those people. Now, it all started for me at design school. Uh, main thing you should know about me when I was doing my master's in industrial design is that I was a student of uh, very average quality. When there would be professors in the, in, in the call right now, they would definitely challenge me on the word average and I would have to admit that I was lower average. Um, I was not the promising guy, that's for sure. I was not engaged, not motivated. And the main reason was that we did quite a lot of projects for SMEs at design school. Uh, SMEs knocking on the door, they didn't have design teams on the payroll, so they tapped into the, the, the design school to get pro bono creative input in their companies. 
we did projects of two or three months where we had to develop and design all kinds of products for those guys. Huh? And I designed teeter seats. I designed uh, a fencing system for balconies. At a certain point, they um, challenged us to design a plastic, a plastic disposable teaspoon with a feature to squeeze the tea bag when you lift the, the tea bag out of the cup of tea to prevent you from dropping on the table. Yeah, and I can tell you in that project, truly, honestly, you know, I started asking myself, like, what kind of problems am I trying to solve? Huh? Where am I putting my time at this point? So I, I was I was asking myself, what the hell am I doing? Uh, and that was actually as well the main reason why I was a very average and quite unhappy student. It was because of every time when leadership, the professors came up to me and they told us like, hey guys, you're going to start a project and the next three months you're going to work on fencing systems. I never ever had a feeling like, yes, fencing systems or yes, a theater seats. It was always like, okay, if you say so. So I was doing the projects I was doing because I had to do it and I was not doing the stuff I was doing because I wanted to do it. And if you do the stuff you do because you have to do it and not because you truly want to do it, it compromises on your well-being and it will compromise as well on the quality of your delivery. So you never will be good. You never will be outperforming. You never will be top notch. So I was an average unhappy student. And when I got in the fifth year, which was a kind of a thesis year where we had to work a full year on a product, by coincidence, I bumped into some people that worked with street connected children and youth in Colombia. And, and they told me about their project in Cartagena, Las Indias, where they um, actually... Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're reaching out to reach those kids uh, in the streets. Uh, those people spoke about a community of 150 million children in the world living on the pavements of the metropolitan cities, uh, cut it off every single basic need you can think of. No education, no healthcare, no food, no protection, no roof, call it, no housing. It's not there. So, you know, being there as a, as a, as a graduating industrial product designer you know suddenly i connected the dots and i saw the opportunity as, as i saw a client base of 150 million kids with needs where i could do stuff that really mattered so i decided hey if i have to work a year pro, pro bono on a product to graduate at design school i'm not gonna do it for philips actually I, I was offered a project to work with philips on redesigning the blender you know a soup blender um and and let's be honest it was not the perfect match to, so i refused to go to philips uh, that would have brought me to eindhoven buster and i would have been close to you guys but i kind of fancied flying to the caribbeans uh, to Colombia for my consumer insight. So I decided I'm going to design a product for street kids. I'm going to produce it in series. I'm going to roll it out all over the world and I'm going to impact them. Uh, and from the moment that I took that decision, I can tell you I completely shifted from a not engaged kind of unhappy, nagging kind of student into a bomb of energy. I was like, okay, give it to me. You know, I'm going to fight my fights. I'm going to do this. Um, maybe a little detailed when I came up with the project to develop a product for uh, street kids at design school in the mid nineties. Let's say that the, the professors were not actually mirroring my enthusiasm. Huh? They were telling me, like, well, you're developing a product for a consuming group that doesn't have the budgets to, to pay for that product. This is ridiculously. If you, if you want to do stuff like that, you have to go to, to social school. This is design school. You know, the, the constant separation in society, the silos in society that are the problem talking about non-profit, for-profit, I think. Uh, so um, these guys were, were blocking me. It was actually through a friend that was studying uh, economics that told me like, yeah, but you shouldn't approach it as a B2C project that eh? you're not gonna develop a product for street kids. You should develop a product for NGOs that work with street kids and UNICEF, UNESCO, these guys have deep pockets so they can pay for your product and then you can make it economically you know, um, uh, relevant. So I kind of had to battle with the professors, but in the end, they, uh, they actually agreed and I could start to develop my product for street kids. Now, uh, one thing we learned at design school, uh, which is fundamental, I think, um, that is the, the, the client have to, has to be centric. Eh? If, you, if you design a product or a service for a, a client, for a customer, you need to 
you need everybody that wants to create needs anthropologist skills you need to be able to really deeply connect with the client understand the client in order to use the the, the reality of the client as the framework to design the service or the, the product. It happens way too often that we build all kinds of fancy stuff claiming to be the experts and then we push it down to consumers. It's not working, eh? so it's really the, the, the connection. So I got on a plane to Cartagena de las Indias, to Colombia, to uh, connect with uh, with Street Connected Children. One, one big problem I had was that my Spanish was limited uh, to ordering uh, a cerveza. Um, and of course, if you don't have to connect with the street kids in Cartagena, it's kind of a difficult thing. So I was kind of forced in, in the role of the observer. Um, the local project director told me that I would have to um, work in a team of uh, outreach uh, street workers. Uh, it was a bunch of people that went to the hotspots in Cartagena, to the places where the street kids were. Um, to bring first line services and and they had two types of first line service there was health they had like a, a first aid kit and and these guys were cleaning out wounds and and, and giving <laughs> improvised health care to those three children the second thing was education and they had a backpack with some books and games uh, mainly secondhand material out of formal education um, I remember a book, you know, it started with I go with mom to the cinema. Yeah, of course, that's not what you need to use when you go to street kids. Uh, it was not, not adapted. We had to do shopping every two weeks because the kids were making all the material because that's the way that they survive. Make something, sell it, make some money and, and buy what you need. Um, so, yeah, it was not working as well. I could see that the kids were very happy when the youth workers arrived. So there were hugs and uh, they were really happy. But the educational, the education was not working. They created games as well on, on drug prevention and TB prevention. And if these games survived like 10 minutes on the streets, it was, uh, yeah, the streets were chaos. The kids were up and down and all around, smoking crack, sniffing glue, fighting with each other. If we had two or three kids that were focused on one educational activity, in a session, it was a big achievement. And after a while, you know, being in the observer role, I got completely frustrated. So I wanted to connect with the kids. Still, my Spanish was like very limited, but I needed to find a, a creative solution. And I found a solution in, in, you can see it here in the picture, the young me. I bought one of these uh, school booklets uh, and I took the booklet to the streets and I approached this little kid, you know, uh, Julian is its name. Typical street kids, always barefooted, uh, you know, way too big, worn out t-shirt that had been white one day, uh, sniffing glue all the time. You can see he has like a big uh, bold stain on his hat, uh, a spot on his hat. That's the consequence of a night in a porch of a shop. Um, but the owner of the shop didn't like the fact that street kids were using his porch as a as a hotel room. So he uh, threw boiling water on the children and, and he, he got burned uh, on his hat. So it's a big scar. Um, so I approached Julian with my booklet and asked Julian, Julian, mi español muy mal. Luckily, he understood and he confirmed like, yes, uh, yeah, that's clear. So I asked him like, Julian, tú, mi profesor, do you want to become my Spanish teacher? And he looked at me at first like very surprised. He was clearly not used to that kind of questions. But then he said like, sí, por qué no, why not? So we settled down on the cartoon board, as you can see in the picture. And I took the booklet and I started drawing. I drew a bird, a house and a tree. And I asked Julian, ¿qué es eso? What is this? So he started writing and he wrote pájaro, uh, árbol, casa. He gave it back to me. I tried to read it out loud, of course, very badly pronounced. So he had good fun. I had a good laugh. He corrected me. I tried again. I made more drawings. We kept on working. And after an hour and a half, uh, my colleagues approached us and told me, like, I don't know, time to wrap up. We have to go. And I asked Rosie, a British volunteer in the project that's spoke uh, perfectly Spanish. I asked Rosie in English, Rosie, please, can you translate to Julian? Can you, can you thank him? I picked up like about 30 words in Spanish. He's really helping me with my vocabulary. Can you please thank him? And can you ask him if we can do this again? And I could see at Julian's reaction that he was as enthusiastic as I was. So we did the street handshakes, you know, and and we walked off. And while walking back to the office, I realized that Julian, who in normal street education wouldn't focus for more than five minutes, had been sitting next to me without moving, writing words for more than an hour. So that evening I went home very self-fulfilled with the idea like, hey, I'm, I'm very good at this job. Next morning, I found out it had nothing to do with my skills because I was back on the streets with my booklet, eager to start working with Julian, but he was not around. 
So I asked another kid, hey, get, get, do you want to be my Spanish teacher? That kid accepted as well. We settled down on the pavement again. We did the same stuff. It worked fine again for about half an hour. And then it went wrong big time. Anybody an ID? Why? Nobody? You can throw it in the chat. Huh? Uh, Anna, can you just come again with a question? Sorry. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I was I was working with the, with the, with the other guy, you know, um, and it worked fine again until like after an hour, half an hour. It it, uh, it went completely wrong. And I see Joanna gave the right answer. Julian arrived, and he saw me sitting with the other kid. And he became angry and he claimed this position back. He said, like, hey, I'm I'm Arnold's teacher, you know, Buddha, you saw your professor the Arnold. And he claimed that position back and they started fighting. And at that moment, I understood what happened. And this is fundamental in education, very fundamental when you work on education with people in poverty, you know. What happened was that because of my limited Spanish, I completely I entered completely differently in the relationship with Julian. Street children, children in poverty, vulnerable children are constantly approached as the needy ones, the ones that need experts, educators, um, you know, psychologists, therapists that come to show them how they should do it. And because of my limited Spanish, I created a relationship with Julian, where for the very from the very first moment, I proved to Julian that he was valuable to me that he created added value to me. So I created a relationship where he was the empowered one. And that's where I learned, if you work in education and you want people to flourish, this is the first concern. Are people empowered? Do they feel empowered? When they are not empowered, you can develop all the best skills of the world, but when there is disruption, they will drop out of these processes. So we noticed as well that in the work with street kids, all the money goes to shelters and rehabs and vocational training. And street educators are pulling these kids into these programs. But we noticed that the dropout rates in these programs were massively. It was about 80, 90 percent of the kids that escaped those, those rehabs and went back to the streets. At first, I asked myself, like, why the hell are they going back to the streets when you get a warm bath and protection and food in a shelter? But after a while, I understood that it's, it's because it was not their decision to leave the streets. It's, it's the lack of empathy as well in society to understand that the streets are not singly bad. We, we, we have the perspective of streets are bad, the shelters and the homes are good, so you need to go from here to here. But for those children, often the streets was the opportunity to escape a very violent situation in a family in a slum. For them, it's often a, an opportunity to, to escape a very abusive situation where they don't feel belonging, where they are the victim. And it's in, beneath that bridge in the city where they find friendship for the first time in life, where they feel belongingness for the first time in life. So really going as society to these people in poverty with our concept of what is good and wrong, is, 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 it's a complete lack of empathy in social work. So, you know, when you tell those guys, you know, you need to leave the street and you need to go to the shelter, you tell them you need to change. You're wrong. You're, you are the one that has to change. And this is a, a very disempowering concept. And empowerment is what we need if you want to lift them out of the streets. You know, I, I always position it like this. In education, you've got the base. It's like a foundation beneath a, beneath a, a, a building. It's, it's the identity. It's the level of empowerment. It's, it's having that solid roots as an individual. And on that base, you can create, you know, projects. Uh, and these projects, that, that's about knowledge. That's about skills. Right? And that's very important. That's what we do in the school system. But when the foundation is not solid, yeah, and you get some, some storm, there is some conflict, people will drop off. So if you, if you have to pull people through disruptive times, when you know that there's going to be stormy weather, you know, you need to focus more on the foundation. You need to build that foundation. And this is about building up a healthy identity, helping them to, to acknowledge their talents, helping them to, to, to develop a set of clear values, helping them to build in some purpose as well in their lives and helping them to create a, a strong network, uh, the belongingness, the human need to feel part of a social concept. 
This is why we get gang culture on the streets, huh? because all these guys, they don't feel belongingness in their families. They don't feel belongingness in the educational, the formal educational systems. So what do they do? They go to the streets and in the sociology of the streets, you get like uh, groups of peers that look for belongingness within those peer groups and they create logo types. They tattoo it on their faces, actually streaming out like, finally, I belong to something. And these kids are, are, of course, they're they're recruited very easily by criminal organizations, by extremist organizations. Lots of the guys here in Brussels that went to Syria to fight with ISIS is that profile of kids. Eh? They're, they don't feel, you know, missed in the family. They don't feel connected with society, with the schools. They 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 feel like, like being excluded out of society. And then suddenly ISIS comes and tells them, with us, you're going to be a hero. We have a role of importance for you to play. It's so easy to, to, to actually recruit them as, as cannon meat for the wrong side. And I can ensure you dealing with those 150 million talents because they are creative, they are entrepreneurial, they have talents. That being recruited by the wrong side of society is going to be a much higher cost than developing creative, non-formal educational systems to, to, to reconnect these guys with, uh, with society. And that's what we did. So I created a, a mobile school, which is a trolley. You can pull into the streets to actually change the streets in a positive educational environment where we completely adapt to the streets. So we don't judge the streets. We train the people that use our materials in, in really accepting the streets as it is. And building processes with these children to build up that self-esteem, to empower them, to build up self-efficacy and bring them to a level where they can decide what they want to do with their lives. And then it's up to them to decide. And we've got lots of kids that go back to school when they are empowered, but there are a bunch of them as well that decide to start a street business in the informal economy. And that's fine for me as well. Uh, we want to bring them to the point where they can make choices. Um, I'm going to show you a short video on how this works. Huh? This is the little trailer, and uh, now there should be a video, I think. <laughs> So this gives a bit of an idea of what we do at mobile school. So we started designing these trailers. With every trailer, there are like more than 250 educational methodologies. And this is from literacy, creative therapy, up until the street business toolkit, which is an MBA for the streets. It's, it's actually the same you would do at an MBA, but then on the level of a shoeshine boy. Uh, because it's my choice to approach that kid as a needy kid or as an entrepreneur. And he's both. You know, but I think this is self-fulfilling prophecy. If I approach him as the needy one, I kind of, yeah, give too much attention to the problem, and this will grow the problem. If 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 he if he has a shoe shine business, he must be entrepreneurial somehow. There must be positivity, and if I give attention to that positivity, I'm sure that this will grow as well. And this is what we see in practice. Huh? So. Um, the focus of everything we do is, if, if we talk about literacy, it's not teaching them how to read and write on the streets. It's really empowering them, showing them like, hey, you see, you can do this as well. You know, you have that potential. It's really about 
giving those uh, those positive incentives on 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 self efficacy in in self self confidence on self esteem. Okay, um, I actually thesis project got out of hands. Huh? I graduated in ninety seven and then I went back to Latin America and I kept on working on this project. And right now we. We have mobile school projects up and running in 30 countries worldwide. Every year we implement about five new of them. It's a social franchising model. So it's local organizations that learn, uh, that use our methodologies. Uh, we provide them of the materials and we give them intensive training and they become part of a network. Uh, mobile school is not just the black box, the blackboard as you see it. It's, it's, it's a kind of a Trojan horse. Eh? You bring it into a foundation and with the trainings, we start shifting the paradigms as well, you know, moving them from a focus on needy poor kids to moving them um, to a focus of uh, on potential, you know, potential talent in the streets and, and building up that positive narrative. At the beginning, I financed all of this with philanthropy. I bumped into a, an entrepreneur here in Belgium, uh, Luc Virelst. He, he, he was a building constructor. He sold his businesses um, and I had a few chats with them. And after a while, he decided to give me some seed money and philanthropy to start up mobile school as a foundation. Actually, in 2002, he uh, provided me of 1,300,000 euros to, to start building up a nonprofit organization to actually scale mobile school. So we did, so we started scaling mobile school, but after five years of working as a nonprofit organization, I kind of got into a personal uh, conflict, um, an ethical conflict actually. Um, and let me explain, you know, we preach sustainable development. Huh? Uh, if somebody's in poverty, you don't have to give them a fish. You know, what you need to do is actually bring these people to the position where they can catch the fish themselves. This is what we do. Translating this to the concrete war that we do at mobile school. When I'm, when I'm in Cali in Colombia on the streets working with street children and there is a shoeshine boy that approaches me and tells me like, hey, guys, I've got like three days without food. I'm starving. Can I get some money to buy food or can I get some food? We tell them like, no, guys, we, we don't give fish. But we have a street business toolkit and I can work with you on your business model of your shoeshine business, helping you to grow that business so that you can prevent to get in situations of extreme hunger in the future. That's what I tell them. But after a while, I started understanding that oh, it was completely inconsistent. You know, if you want to change the world, you need new ideas. But as important as the new idea is the, 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 the authenticity of your model, the walking, the talk, the being what you preach. Hey, and, and, and the reality was that I was actually doing fundraisers. I was asking for donations, subsidies. That was fish that was given to me with that fish. I build an organization. I produce mobile schools. I fly them into Colombia. I pay for a ticket to fly to Colombia myself to go and train street educators. And when I'm on the street with those educators and there is a kid in extreme poverty that tells me, I'm starving, can I get some food? I'm the one that tells that kid like, no, I don't believe in bagging. How inconsistent can you be? Who am I to claim that position to preach that to that child when I'm not applying it to myself? So actually, we got in a big, massive ethical conflict where we said, like, we can't keep on doing this. And I think that's a big bug in the nonprofit world. Lots of experts that are paid with money that is given to them, actually teaching people how they should self-sustain economically. But how the hell can you claim to be an expert in, in doing that when you're not taking care of your own economical model? So I decided in 2008, hey, if I want to go on with mobile school, I need to start catching fish myself. So I started reflecting on, on what kind of a business can I build, a profitable business to make enough money to reinvest that money in building more mobile school projects and scaling up my impact on street kids. You know, and then actually the thing of empowerment, huh? think about the base and the foundation is, is applicable to ourselves as individuals and organizations as well. My solution came out of my proper base. It was like, what am I good at? You know, why are my talents? What, what gives me energy? You know, it is about purpose. It's about the values. It was 
quite quite fast it became crystal clear that i needed to make money with education because education is what we aspired me myself but my colleagues as well the people that i hired in the in the nonprofits so i said like how the hell can i make money with education so i started screening the markets uh, looking for a business opportunity and rather fast i bumped into the market of executive training you know consultants companies selling training to other companies training leadership training communication skills training negotiation skills training you know whatever you know only in belgium that's a 2 billion uh, euro market huh? it's, a, it's a it's a big massive global market where actually the the margins you can make on these trainings are very interesting as well huh? if you sell training to these multinational companies and so on on the other hand i understood as well like if i want to change the world if i truly want to have impact on the situation of kids living in severe poverty there, there is, of course, a source, eh? a reason. There is a, a macroeconomic model that, that causes this system of division in society. And if I want to solve it, I can't work only on this side. I need to work on the other side as well. So I saw an opportunity as well to start influencing the, the business world and bringing more sustainability thinking into the business communities and work world. So I decided I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build a business, a, a training company. I'm going to sell trainings, uh, leadership trainings to Coca-Cola, to Ikea, to Nike. I'm going to sell to all these companies. Uh, I'm going to actually uh, positively, uh, how do you say, uh, inspire them on more sustainability through bottom-up processes in these big multinational companies. But I'm gonna invoice for the training as well. I'm gonna make profits, and my profits, you know, I'm, I'm, they're not profits because I reinvest them in educational programs for street kids. Full 100% of what we earn with the companies is reinvested in education for street kids. This was the model. Now I can tell you, the board told me like, yeah, why should companies? Why would companies buy from us? You know, you don't have the suits to go and talk with Coca-Cola. You don't have to. You don't speak their language. So I needed to do the anthropologist work again. As I was in Cartagena with Julian, I needed to, to start infiltrating the business communities and actually starting to understand what the needs were of the business community. So I subscribed at the business school uh, at Flerik here in Belgium. I went to business school. Part of business school was building the, the business plan of, of, of the company that I was setting up. And you know, rather fast, I found out that in the market research that the market was completely saturated. And there were like 1,600 companies only in Flanders selling training to other companies. So market was completely packed. And um, yeah, I realized that all these competitors, they had like references, they had proven models, they had the databases full of leads. And, and I was the guy that played around with street kids. So I knew if I want to enter that market, I need a USP. I need a unique selling proposition. You know where I found it, the USP? That's again in the base. Who are we? Why are, are we building a business? Why are we doing what we're doing? It was all about street kids. So what I did was I started partnering up with the street children. Because in every single project where I've worked, there is a lot of misery. But in every single project, you find some of these guys as well that outperform the others, the champions in survival, the ones that make the streets, the, the reality on the streets that, that deal with that reality and that make the impossible possible on the streets. Just a quick example. Udiel is a guy I bumped into in Guatemala, in Antigua. He hands out leaflets of pizzerias to tourists in Antigua, trying to convince them to go, go to the pizzeria. If you accept a leaflet, his name is written on it. He's going to tell you, please give it to the owner of the restaurant, because at night, before closing time, he passes by. They count how many leaflets with his name, and he gets paid commission in pizza or coins. That's how he survives. Street kid in Antigua, Guatemala. When I bumped into him, you know, I, I refused the leaflet because they're offering you leaflets at, at every corner. And then he said to me, the que país, from which country do you come? And I didn't want to be impolite, so I kept on walking, but I said, soy de Belgica. And then he said, ah, de Belgica, que interesante. Entonces, sos francófono flamenco. Are you Flemish or francophone? And then I stopped because, to be honest, every when I bumped into Americans in Latin, Latin America, you know, people from the States, they often ask me, like, isn't Belgium the capital of Brussels? They, they often don't know that we exist. And then I had a guy from the streets that knew about a Francophone and a Flemish and a uh, Dutch speaking community in Belgium. So I told them like, like, uh, so Flamenco, I, I speak, I speak Flemish. 
And then he said, oh, dan kunnen wij Nederlands spreken. So then we can speak Dutch in my language. So I completely drained with sympathy. Sympathy, the guy spoke my language. So I took the leaflet and I was about to go to the pizzeria, but then I realized like, you know, you little bastard, you probably learned that sentence in different languages. It's just your trick to win sympathy from the customer and, and win the competition on the streets. Actually, I, I loved it. And I was about to go to the pizzeria, but I thought like, you, you know, you win this battle, but I'm going to challenge you, you know, on the war. So I asked him some questions in Flemish, but he answered me as well. And his Flemish was, was better than the Flemish of our prime minister in Belgium at the moment that I bumped into the kit. And I found out that the guy speaks 12 languages, never has been to school. He speaks Hebrew, Japanese, Danish, Italian, Spanish, 12 languages. And then the main question is not like, what is his talent? Because that's crystal clear. He has a talent for languages. But the question is like, how the hell is he capable to develop that talent in those circumstances? Because he's in a context where everything is against him. And still, he's able to develop that skill. Nobody pays for his education. There is no HR department offering him a course or a book or whatever. He has to do it by himself. So... He is one of the stories, and I can give you like a dozen of those stories. And what we started doing was, was profiling those winners on the streets, profiling those outperformers. Like, why are they the ones sticking out? And, and we, we found a, sk a skill set, an attitude set that was clearly present within all those winners on the streets. And we called that set, it's, it's actually a set of four skills slash attitudes. We called that the street skills. And with those street skills, I developed training. I brought it back to companies. I made films with the kids on the streets as the experts and the inspirators. And I started selling leadership training to make companies more streetwise or street smart. Uh, the skills are these. The first one is the opportunity focus. What you notice with the guys that outperform on the street is they're not nagging about problems. You know, Houdiel easily could say, here I am with my language talent, uh, talent for languages, but, you know, um, I can't do anything with it and uh, I'm a victim because, you know, my mom and dad are responsible. They never gave me education. My staff dad who boost all the money away, the bad educational system, the corrupt politics, the global economical reality. He has plenty of very good legitimate arguments to claim that he is the victim. The winners on the streets, they are winners because they know that it's strategically very, very uh, stupid to claim the victim position. Never ever claim that fiction, the victim position. And, and what they do is, is put all their time and energy in not what others should do differently, but in what they can do differently. They are busy with what can I do instead of what should the others do. Let's be honest, I need to find the first company in Western Union, uh, Europe still where sales is not blaming production, that they're not producing what we can sell in market and production is blaming sales, that they're not selling what we can produce in the factories and we just point to each other. That's a lack of opportunity focus and focus on what we can do differently. And that's what we can learn from those guys on the streets. This is what we train in companies. The second thing is agility and resilience. And that's about the base, eh? or I use the boxing sack as well as the metaphor. You know these things. If you forget to open up the little tap at the bottom and put water in it and you hit the ball, it's going to fly in all directions. But when there is weight at the bottom and you hit the ball, it's going gonna, it's gonna to kick back. And that, 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 that weight at the bottom, that's the roots again. That's the foundation, you know? It's, it's, it's building in those, 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 those healthy identities. And I think this is an opportunity for companies as well. Working on, on, you know, having so much people going in burnout, having so much people that are not performing because of stress and so on. It, it's, 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 it's a way of, you know, building up a more agile workforce as well by giving them like, business connected purposes you know not only working for the shareholder but working for a, a higher kind of purpose within your business building up more healthy networks that are not only you know business opportunistic networks but as well you know caring networks huh? building in rituals within those companies huh? uh, actually evolving from companies with a mission statement and, and a value set that actually 
exist as as a row of banners that are shown at uh, marketing events up into a mission and, and a value set that you can feel when you speak with the leadership. So there is a long way to go with, with, with companies, I believe. Uh, the proactive creativity, that's a no-brainer, of course, on the streets. If you do what everything is doing, everybody is doing, then you're out of the game. And this is about risk-taking. And the fourth one is cooperative competition. It's actually balancing out in between competitive and cooperative behavior, being able to fight and battle, but as well being able to, to, to collaborate and build alliances. And, and this skill with the winners on the street, it's mainly about timing. It's about picking your battles. You know, when you're in a, in a, in a difficult situation, it's, it's not getting frustrated about everything that is going wrong. It's, it's, it's really focusing, picking your battles and compromising on some stuff as well. So uh, this is the set of skills that we find on the streets. And this is the backbone of our training company. So I created uh, a bunch of products, uh, you know, keynote speeches, deep dives. We take managers of companies to the streets. We do leadership programs and youth detention centers where we match executives of companies with, with youth criminals and where they have to form teams together to build uh, materials for mobile school. We do digital learning tracks and so on. So we have a, an offer of products we bring to companies. With this offer, I, I tweak these companies. And of course, I'm not naive. I'm not going to I'm gonna, not going to influence the, the global strategy of Coca-Cola, but I can influence leadership bottom up. And, 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 and I got to the point as well in change making that change making is about collateral. It, it, it's, it's about, yeah, it's, it's about collaborative leadership and it's about systemic shift. And, and I have to to accept and admit that I'm not the one that I, and, and, and you won't be, and nobody will be the one that creates the change we need in, the, in society. It's a collaborative thing to do. And what I'm convinced of is that with Streetwise, what we do in these companies, we're, we're part of the wave, actually moving them into the next concept, the next paradigm of doing business. What we definitely need if we want to give a future to our grandchildren. Eh? Climate change is coming, you know, uh, migration is coming, polarization, uh, democratic models are under pressure, you know, we need a shift in society. Now, uh, every year we sell to about 100 companies. Uh, we do leadership for Barco, we do, and, and many of them are recurrent clients that come back uh, to us um, every once in a while. Uh, we invoice to these guys, they pay and all profits, actually it's not profits because it, it stays in the organization, the money, but all the money is reinvested in street smart educational programs. Now, maybe linking it to ad tech and to technology, after a while of working with, uh, with the programs on the streets and now I'm back to the social part of our organization, we noticed that in youth work, there was a lack of impact measurement and case management. We, we noticed that in the programs, uh, youth work and, and non-formal educational programs, it's, people work very generously with a big heart for the kids, but, but there is no data. Uh, so we actually wrote an Erasmus Plus program as well uh, a few years ago, and we did a research on case management and impact measurement methodologies and, and, and tools that are used in youth work. Uh, we had like 130 respondents uh, uh, working with us and, and it was a sad story. We couldn't find, most organizations have the biggest difficulty, uh, difficulty to, to measure the output, not even speaking about the input. And actually the, the problems that we, that we found was that they experience uh, impact measurement and case management as an administrative la hassle. They acknowledge that they lose subsidies or investors because of not being able to measure, um, you know, and you see a, a bunch of, of, uh, of, of conclusions that we actually found in the research done with these uh, educators. But we, we saw an opportunity. Um, we are convinced that, that the gut feeling and, and generously belly of, of the social worker or the educator is is, is very important. And there is research done as well that shows that often they're right eh, in the decisions that they take, but adding in some data on impact really can scale the impact of the investments we're already doing in non-formal education. So we decided to start to build a tool to help organizations to actually get track of impact. 
So um, next to the mobile schools, and that's the one on the right, the street smart wheels, we call it. This is the trolleys you saw in the video. We created three new products that are technology products. Street Smart Impact is an app that is designed for youth workers with an app for youth as well, where you can actually, it's a coaching app that helps you to do your work on the streets, but it gives you data as well. Data to learn on the, the, the empowerment level of the kids, because that's what we want to measure. Do we empower them? Are we making those foundations stronger? It's not about the skills, the competencies. Um, that's what they do in schools and formal education, and they have like ways to measure the impact. It's about the identity, you know, the, the, the base. Now, next to the Impact app, we created a content platform, Street Smart Play, where we actually share all the material we have designed for the wheels, for the trolleys, but it's online and it's free and open. Everybody can access it. Um, and we're now building Street Smart Learn, which is an LMS, a learning management system for youth workers. Because what we noticed as well, certainly if we go to Latin America, Africa, Asia, and the development countries, often the youth workers are not really well trained. It's, it's generous people, but they lack knowledge. They lack training. So we're building a, a learning management system for youth workers where we use micro learning, you know, working with micro bytes to train them on concepts of self-esteem, self-efficacy, belongingness, and, and the important topics actually to be able to bring the right stuff to the kids. And then our ambition, actually, we were able to build all of this uh, because of an investment from Google.org uh, that helped us uh, actually to build the technology. Um, and now the next thing is we're, we're implementing the Impact app now. It's, it's been used now in youth work in the 13 biggest cities over here in Flanders and within the mobile school network internationally. We just sold the technology as well to um, uh, an health insurance fund, the health insurance funds network in Belgium because they're building a, a kind of a, an outreach health worker strategy um, in order to, to, to work on COVID. Actually, it was triggered by COVID, but these health insurance uh, companies, they're sending out outreach people to the communities. And those people are going to use our technology as well to measure impact and to follow up the processes. So we um, were launching that, that impact app, but of course, this will give data as well. And now we're like actually exploring and we're starting. And this was why I want to talk with you, Buster. But we're thinking, what, what can we do with this data? You know, can we, can we learn out of that data to create the right triggers? For example, if a youth worker uses the app to get like some advice of some content from the play that he can use or, or some training that is triggered out of the, out of the, the learn system. But, but this is where we are at this point, really exploring to dive into to your world. Uh, to, is there an opportunity to actually use AI and use the newest technology to combat child poverty? That's where we are at this point. Hey, and I'm going to wrap it up. I think my time is, uh, is over. You can find me as well on the details. I'll share the slide deck as well later on. But this is what we do. And I'm happy to try to answer all your questions. Thank you very much, Arnaud, for this inspiring talk. Uh, and I, I think every one of us uh, can make a nice link with what Buster was uh, what was saying. And uh, so it, it's different um, because you have a personal story, the two of you. Uh, but at the same time, there are many, many similarities uh, also in the thinking uh, and, and the mindset, uh, I think. Uh, so. That was very inspiring. Um, I opened the floor for some questions. Uh, I think, Tony, uh, you are reacting. Uh, maybe you would like to uh, yeah. give a few comments or ask a question. Yeah, so, sorry, I had to just jump off slightly because of other work projects. But I just, yeah, I just, um, I think it's a, a, an absolutely wonderful uh approach, as you said, talking from an empowering versus disempowering, uh, you know, we want to fix you uh, approach. And, um, you know, I, there's just this wonderful analogy that you wrote about being streetwise and how much we can learn from that. And it just reminded me of this uh, book on Be More Pirate, that, uh, you know, if, if, you wanna, if, you, if you want to really create change, change in education systems you know do you are, are, are you part of the problem or part of the solution and and, and that honor that that you just looked at something from a whole different way of 
living mm -hmm. and, and viewing things um, to change education systems. So I wonder from that how we, you know, that education systems, just as Buster said, need complete, there needs to be a fundamental change in education systems. And I wonder how this can be taken forward, mm -hmm. you know, in formal uh, yeah, education. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think often there is a lack of there is the lack of empathy and a really truly client focus. I, when I work in schools, I often tell these these teachers in schools, you know, you, you should look at your as a, you should look at your clients, and and you have this job because of your clients. So you need to whatever happens with the kids or whatever happens with the parents, it's about you to empathize, understand, and be creative and develop models that really work for them. But so many schools, so many people in education are complaining about the kids of today and the parents that are not supported anymore. Yeah. So we don't we, we need that entrepreneurial spirit within education, I believe. Yeah. And we need yeah. to understand as well that there are millions of children in the world that won't go through the formal educational processes, millions of them. And if we don't develop alternatives, if we're not able to, to shift our paradigm and, and, and see other opportunities, we're going to lose them. And those are the guys that are going to end up in prisons, that, that, that are going to end up in, in, the cost is massively. Wow. But Thank there you. is the problem, in my opinion, as well, if you look mm. at, at government, the, the, the fact that we approach everything in those silos. Because, because you know, if we, if we can prevent children and youngsters of going into, you know, jails, there is a, a very positive economical impact on, on, on society and government, and that money can be reinvested in, in, uh, in education, or, or we should upfront invest in education to work on the problems of recidivism. But, but the problem in society is that we look at everything in silos, and that's the same thing in education. I was at design school, you know, it was a blast for me to end up in social work. And the cool thing, my opportunity to innovate in social work as well was because of not being trained in a, in a social school. I was not wired as all the other guys in that field. I was wired differently. And that diversity is needed. So I'm always claiming like at university, sent all the guys in, in, in psychology and, and, and social work, sent them like three months to business school and get the guys from business school uh, three months into, you know, mix, mix, mix diversity. Yeah, can I add to that? I don't know. Uh, I was also wondering. You, you you were talking about the uh, the street skills that you're training in in companies. Um, have you ever thought about training teachers with these street skills? Yeah, we did, we did research and and we got a lot of demand as well from schools. Um, but the problem is that that we the business model. The, okay. The yeah. Schools they the schools don't have yeah. budgets or. Actually, in the school cultures and, the, and the, the school governance is not used to invest in training of teachers. If you look at the, the budgets that are provided for teacher training in Belgium, that's, that's, that's yeah. just sick. That's just sick. Those are the guys that need to inspire our kids. They just, they receive like a few, few half days a year. They receive like some, some training education and, and, and they have peanuts to pay for it. So they get monkeys. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but, but, you know, and, and uh, we are willing for social impact to, to actually, that's where I want to go. If I, if I can grow my business and get to a point where I can make enough money in the corporate world and COVID is a good thing for us at that sense, because, because of COVID suddenly my market is global. Um, I, I just sold a leadership program to Beringer Ingelheim in Latin America. I delivered from the office in Leuven with online training. Before COVID, online training was, was like uh, yeah. still something very, very strange. And, and, and suddenly my market is global. So, so we are actually uh, um, adapting our ambitions. But I can, when, when I can take more margins at the business side and, and you know, there is more money to invest. And one of the things that we, we consider to do is offering our trainings uh, to the educational system at lower fees. Yeah. But what we need as well is a mind shift because mm -hmm. often in the school, in the educational system, it's not that there is no money. It's, it's the governance of schools that doesn't put importance to the training context. And then I can do my work for 
pro bono or low cost to them. But when there is not a mindset shift, um, yeah, yeah. we would we would be we wouldn't work for all the schools. We would work for the people where we truly find that they uh, yeah they, they can are, have that mindset. They are the innovators. They are the ones yeah. that really wanna wanna. Yeah. Okay. Really thank you. Um, I think Arno, you also had a question in the chat. Uh, maybe you can. Uh... Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, for the inspiring talk. Uh, it, it was a really interesting presentation. Um, so now my question to you is: um, So what would you tell to people uh, who would like to start initiatives such as mobile school? Um, but are too afraid to work in, in, in street environments because, yeah, I can imagine so, because of problems such as abuse or drugs or, or et cetera. Yeah, I can imagine that, that people may be afraid for their own life uh, in certain ways and, and they, sh yeah, they might get rid of their whole idea simply because of, of, of that. Of that. Um, so is there something you would like to else to yeah. such people i just i just can share from my own experience i've been i've been seven years in latin america working in in areas la Hoya, el calvario in cali police doesn't enter that area anymore um guatemala city is is quite rough as well i never was threatened by anybody any of the gangs when we had problems and troubles it was police hmm. and i i consistently believe that if you approach somebody on equal level you're truly interested and you truly value the person you're talking to giving your full self and looking him in the eyes they will sense this they will feel this and they will respond to you in a similar way i walk into realities where people tell me you're crazy but I just approach those guys and I tell them like, hey, I'm interested. You know, I, I, I want to know who you are. I once, I once was in Buenos Aires and there were some guys that, that, that had created some, you know, places to live close to the, the highway. They were under a bridge and next to the bridge and they had like built some stuff. And it was quite interesting because it was a slum thing, but they had like two floors and I, and I saw it from a distance. So I was like, yeah, I want to know, you know, I'm, I'm not thinking about it anymore. It's just my curiosity. So I approached them and um, I told them like, hey, I, I've been working on the streets in Guatemala and, and you know, I have lots of friends in the streets and, and seeing how they survive. But, you know, what you've created here, it's it looks very cool. How have you done this? And, you know, and I, I just was interested and they just told me like, come and see. So I went with them and they they it's as a, a friend of mine that, that was renovating a house here in Belgium that invited me to see the tiles in his back room, being really proud of what he created. These guys were showing me the shack they had created. And, and I, I ended up staying like half a day with these guys. There was a birthday. They invited me some drinks. They don't have money, but they, they had some drinks and they invited me and I stayed with them and I spoke with them. And I, it's, it's your attitude. It's, it's, 80% your attitude. And of course, there is a risk. There is a risk of, let's say, 10, 15, 20%. But you don't have to be, yeah, yeah. don't, don't. It should not I, I'm, I'm a guy as well. Uh, I think, yeah. I think as well for the ladies and the girls, and probably it's, 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 it's a different reality. But for me, that's the way that I look at it. And it never failed me. Mm -hmm. it never failed me. Yep. If you give respect to people, but deep, honest respect, if they sense that people in poverty, they won't do you anything. Mm -hmm. They will be so surprised and happy that somebody yeah. from society sees them and is interested in them. And that becomes then so much more important for them and such a big opportunity that they're not going to be busy with robbing you because you're giving them something that is more important than your wallet. And that's the attention that's seeing them. <laughs> I think it's also a matter of trust uh, from both sides. Yeah. Absolutely, and I think that's that's it's a it's it's a society thing. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. if if I if yeah. I project it to companies, it's it's we we need to we need to go to much more trust based leadership. We need to to we need to start using empathy as a hard skill in in our society. Yeah? I, I always claim that empathy is the hard skill we need today. 
uh, it's 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 the, it's all interconnected. Eh? We're all interdependent. I just I just shared the the, the B Corp link. Eh? The the B Corp community. It's they they speak a lot about interdependency. Everything is connected in society. So what we do in business influences the the other stuff as well. And and being aware about that complexity and mm-hmm. and being part of a movement that tries to come up with the new normal. But I can tell you, I can tell you mainly to the students, if you want to be an entrepreneur, eh, if you have ambitions to be an entrepreneur, you can become a very successful entrepreneur and doing very good stuff for society. It's, it's not separate. It's not, the discussion is not not for profit or for profit. That's just a legal setup. I, I've, been, I've been working in a company structure and then I moved to a nonprofit structure. Now we're in a nonprofit structure doing our business and reinvesting because that's the easy, easiest way for me and the most, you know, on governments, the most uh, transparent way of organizing it. But what the fuck? I, I, nonprofit, for profit, whatever. It's it's about what you do and how you do it. That's a, a good link with uh, <laughs> the discussion this afternoon, the Oxford debate. <laughs> Thank you, Arnold, for saying that. Um, I, 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 I know we are running a little bit out of time, but uh, maybe there is uh, some some room for one more question. Uh, anyone? Uh, if 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 not, I have uh, maybe one. Um, I think yeah, Ivan uh, wanted to ask something. Ah, sorry, sorry, Ivan. Uh, yes, please. If I I can relate. Sure. Somehow, um, because first of all, I teach at Tempus in Malta, and Tempus is a college or slash even part university that we started our uh, our let's say we opened our doors to anyone and when i say anyone at first we we pitched our education for level four students but over time we went even to level one and level two people some people were were afraid to go to low down to those levels we even remove any burdens like that you cannot get to that level or to another and if students had special conditions like dyslexia, HDHD, etc. In fact, we, our own team, and I work as part of that team as well. I'm a support coordinator myself. I help, I help students. So students who have certain, let's say, special needs, we call them. But funnily enough, that these students, rather than being on the streets, we don't usually have on the streets, but without education, because student, if a student is without education, basically he's doomed. Okay, so uh, if you open uh, that example of whether you give him money or you give him food or rather train him, educate him, uh, knowledge is really powerful. Knowledge is uh, if you teach someone, that's the key for success. So if you do, uh, let's say, country wise, we have seen results where the number of people unemployed, the number of people looking for work here in Malta went down, um, downhill because of this initiative where our institute went up to 7,000 students. And a percentage, a group percentage of them are students without co- proper qualification. But funnily enough, they start without qualification by, by they end up with a degree, okay? From level two, they manage to get up to level six. Now we are introducing level seven as well. So um, obviously it takes dedication, it takes patience, but you need to do the right infrastructure. We have support personnel like myself. We have specialized departments that they are helping students with their own needs. Um, uh, whether you have a particular issue, don't worry. We have uh, psychologists, we, we have guidance teacher, we have therapists. We even try to, to help them financially, if possible, all right? We try to find them summer jobs so that they can start that down. And the most important thing, they, they are never put away from the education because the moment that they are put away from education, again, then disaster and the whole palace will grow, will collapse. So uh, that's something which we need to keep down. There's more to say, but that is in a synthesis what I wanted to sh- share with you because very impressive. It's it's a it's a teaching is a vocation. Doing such thing with street people is even more. 
and helping yes. people who cannot reply you with uh, and pay you back it's even it gives you more gratitude so i can relate from that angle but the most important thing is even especially for this group uh, we have young uh, peers and students here uh, it's always education is the key for your success if you can take it to a higher level keep on trying don't give up it there are, there are support there are ways and means if you fail don't worry you can try again so it's, it's it's not a game that you are, if you don't manage on, on your first occasion, then you are, uh, you're not successful, you are a failure. No, that's not true. We have students that through the mainstream have been labeled as uh, unsuccessful as a failure and they have turned the tables and now they are uh, working in a leading companies as a programmers, as a developers, as, as carers, as support, as anything. Because we have uh, MCAS as a, lots of institutes and basically we have all the fields. So um, uh, you name it there, it's there for them to find there, whether they want art, whether they want creativities or sciences, anything, anything. And we go keep on adding these kind of opportunities for such people. But it's, a, it's then up to them to, to take, raise a little bit the bar and take it to a higher level. So I want to thank you and end up with this conclusion. So thank you very much because we need a lot of social entrepreneurs. We need a, a lot of persons who take initiative and we need a lot of people who can relate. Even if I'm not a social worker myself, I'm just an entrepreneur teaching IT, teaching <laughs> um, business subjects, but then I ended up doing the work of social worker as well there. So, uh, um, uh, it's it's a it's a very gratification gratifying uh, uh, job because when you help a person who say, who no one else is go, is is helping him or her, you can make a whole difference in their in their life and um, uh, it's it goes beyond the monetary um, let's say ideology or means so uh, we can promote as much as possible from that point of view so thank you very much I want to get. Thanks. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Ivan. I think we should have had a third speaker this morning <laughs> and ask Ivan to tell his uh, personal story as well. I don't know, Arno, you would like to this uh, uh, to, to react to this, Arno? Uh, or no, no. Congrats. Sounds really yeah, good. Yeah. And I think yeah. I think engaging yeah. with uh, no, for me it's it's uh, yeah the. the I think it, it's it's the wave we have to create, and um, I think the main thing, if you start uh, uh, as an entrepreneur in education or as an educator, it's 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 really as well. I think often people get disencouraged because they don't have access to the solutions, and they get frustrated because of the system. But it's 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 understanding that it's a systemic shift we're creating, and and not having the ambition to to be on stage. Uh, and claim that you're going to be the one that brings the solution. It's, it's about being aware that you can take steps and be part of that solution. And, and we need that kind of people that want to go in those collaborative models of change. And, and uh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's where we have to be. I think that's what is needed.